And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Marcello De Francisci, film composer who has worked on projects of global acclaim. We will be discussing his out-of-body travels and how we are not only residing here, but simultaneously in other realities and more. Marcello, thank you for being my guest today and welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Let's just start with how you started having out-of-body travels. I, I've had body out of, out of travels throughout my whole life. As a child, I, uh, I remember we, uh, my, we, I traveled a lot as a child. My parents live in different places and my grandparents would live in Buenos Aires in Argentina. So I would tell my dad, um, I'm going to go see grandmother tonight. And then I would find myself flying over the ocean at nighttime. And then I would have images, recollections of being in the kitchen with my grandmother. And, you know, and so I was very lucky because, you know, they say that you choose your parents. So I obviously chose my parents because my father encouraged those things. He always said, you know what, don't, don't ever lose that, keep doing that. He mm-hmm. didn't never, it, as if it was a, something strange. And I grew up um, raised Catholic through my mother, Italian background, but my father had a lot of esoteric books in the house. So, um, you know, I, 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 I grew into it naturally it was something that obviously i had chosen as a child so was there a spiritual event that happened to you in your life even as a child that would be a catalyst to have you start doing this i do recall i had a very traumatic past life where or one of them at least where i was um where i exited that life in a very traumatic way um uh i can go into detail at some point if you like um but I remember having very tormented dreams, waking up, yelling, and my mother would come in the room and say, you're all right, you're all right. And that dream would come over, it would would come over and over again, uh, the same images in Europe during the, could have been the 1200, something like that. Um, And so I think, having those recollections as a child kind of opened me up maybe, or I was open or so I started to become very much aware of my dreams. And then eventually I started to realize that I could naturally use them to, to attain experiences. And uh, it was something very natural to me. Would you say all of your out of body traveling is during sleeping or can you do it otherwise Conscious. consciously yes there there are many times i did them sleeping um in the beginning but then i i you know i started um i i got into um my parents were involved in they, they, even though my mother was being raised catholic my dad was always trying to convince her to get into meditation so i started tm at the age of 13 and then around the age of 15 um I never, never, ever did drugs, never took drugs. It was something that I had no interest in as a, in my youth. And even though I was being offered it many times. And so one day I went to my father and I said, I'm looking for something, but I don't know what it is. And he took me to the center where these people were teaching, actively teaching a doctrine that was based on out of, out of body soul travel, they called it. And I was with that group for about 10 years. And um, I, I read the lessons and I followed their doctrine. They had a teacher, a master. And around the age of 26, when I came back to the United States and I saw the actual group and its initiates here in the United States, I, I was very disillusioned because I saw that people weren't having the experiences I was having and they weren't really following the interest to pursue this. And so I, um, at the time I read, the autobiography of a yogi by Paramahansa Yogananda and I, and I thought to myself, I'm not, I'm not, I'm never going to get to experience the things that I'm reading in this book with this group. So I decided never to follow a master again. And I continued my disciplines, my own meditations. And it took me a few years, but I can honestly say that 
following my own journey, my own path and having the courage to do it, I found a lot of answers for myself, answers that a lot of books kind of talk about, but they never really give you the techniques. You know, you can talk about a master. You can talk about, you know, for example, Carlos Castaneda was a book. Well, I read all his books multiple times and you read his books and they're fascinating. And I kept asking myself, how did, how how do you get to how do you get there? It's you know you can read the books and say, wow, you know, there's a story of uh, one of the members of Carlos Castaneda groups called Don Genaro, who could do these incredible feats, and you would say, well, how do these people get to that point? And so with the disciplines that I that I acquired and 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 the you know and always researching and reading and and and, and making connections, connecting the dots. I was able to finally get to the point where I could understand and, and see how they got to those places, how they were able to achieve these things. You know, I mean, and I'm in the process of, of pursuing that as I live my day to day life and, you know, and, and, and live a life here on Earth. Why is it for so many people, especially the first time, an out of body experience is a frightening experience? Well, I think that. We have guides. We make we make arrangements before we come here. And so I've seen it in people. For example, somebody will have a normal life during a certain period. And they're like, and they make an agreement. They say, I want to go and enjoy life for what it is. I don't want to know anything for the first 30 years of my life. But then I have an assignment because I've come down here. You know, it's a privilege to come down here. There's a lot of people in line. And so I have a, you know, I I have to, there's a part of my life that I have to a test for things that I've decided to do in this lifetime. So I've seen it many times where it takes a traumatic event that one has decided to do, or one of your one of your ancestors or your or your guides will push you in a direction where you have no other choice but to have a traumatic event so that you have that experience. Otherwise, you would just go on your merry way and have a wonderful life and never have an idea of that there's something more than just what this earth plane offers. So for some people, it's like that. For me, uh, I mean, I, I, I was open. I was always open. My parents had signs when I was, when, when I was in my mother's womb that I would have some abilities. Um, and so I came with it. Um, I remember as a child when I couldn't speak, looking across the room and seeing my parents and, and asking the question, who are those people? And hearing a voice telling me, those are your parents in this lifetime. That is going to be your father. I had no idea who he was. So those memories of having experienced those things, you, you know, the, 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 the real challenges is when you're born, you have a lot of knowledge. You're still in contact with the beings that have sent you here. You can see them. You know, when you hear about those children that see, they have a little clown, imaginary clown that they can only see. Have you ever heard about that? Or, or children that, that play with some imaginary friend that appears to them, nobody can see them. Yes. What a lot of don't realize is those imaginary friends first of all they're not imaginary some of them are guides that are actually preparing that soul for what they're about to experience here because some of those souls are terrified and so the guides appear as, as what they call the imaginary friend and they they start to indoctrinate them and prepare them and then those a lot of those people forget about those imaginary friends. I encourage people that have had those imaginary friends to see if through meditation they can contact those imaginary friends. And I can guarantee them that that, that friend that looked like a clown, it looked like whatever, eventually it would, it would turn into a light being or something far greater than what, anything they could imagine if they were able to consciously contact that imaginary friend once again in their adulthood. Now, you're a very accomplished film composer. Do you think that was your life purpose, or do you think that was just something that you were successful at and enjoying life until you have this traumatic event happen to you that 
will change your life? Well, um, music transports me. When I'm writing music, I'm transported to places. And so I spend a lot of time alone in the studio because it takes me to those places. I hear the, the resonance, the vibration of the music I'm writing sometimes takes me to those realities. Um, and so it's almost like a drug. You know, you want to be there. And, and sometimes that indulgence is not a great thing because I came here to experience this earth as well. You know, I did not choose a life to go into the mountain and disappear. And my choice was to be among the living and to understand and to, because the greatest spiritual challenge is being among people. Anyone can go to a mountain and, and isolate themselves and say, okay, you know, and that's a great choice if you want to do that. But the greatest spiritual challenge is being among people and maintaining your point of focus. That's where the greatest, the greatest lessons are, too. And so I, I try to do a bit of both. You know, there's times where I socialize and I'm around people. And then there's a lot of time that I spend in the studio writing music um, and, and, and basking in that wavelength that, that happens when I'm creating music. Have you ever heard music during your astral travels that has inspired you or affected you in the music that you write today? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I studied, uh, one of the groups that I study with, they're called the Radha Swamis. Um, they were founded by a master called Guru Nanak. Uh, Guru Nanak taught the art of leaving the body. And so the Radha Swamis have a map that you can look at. And they talk about the different planes of consciousness. And they have what they call the Simram, which is the secret mantras of each plane. So in their meditation practices, they teach you the Simram when you're initiated. I don't, I'm not a part of the Radha Swamis. I studied with them. Um, it was one of the many groups that I, that I studied with. Um, and so when you, when you chant the name of these secret planes, which is, for example, the astral plane, the causal plane, the mental plane, um, eventually you start to have the experience within these realms. And the, the fascinating thing that I love about their map is they say that each individual plane has a different sound. So in order for you to know where you are sometimes, because sometimes you may leave the body and you may say, where am I? Am I in the casual plane? Am I in the astral plane? Am I in this region? Am I in that region? You can tell by the sound of the region to know where you are. And I believe it was one of the highest regions before you reach what they call the non-material realms. Uh, it's a region where you hear, they say it's the sound of a thousand violins. There's another region where you're there and you hear the sound of birds, thousands of birds in the background. And, and the sound, what they call the sound, because they teach... The doctrine teaches that the universe is made up of two things, light and sound. And so when, when, when you do the meditations, eventually you start to hear the sound. And so I have found myself floating and hearing thousands of islands. Um, and, and the music, the incredible thing about that experience is that the music is not just heard. It's... It's inside you. It's it's everywhere. It it it, it permeates through you. Um, and so yeah. And so obviously, that music has affected me. Having all those experiences, obviously, you are in, you know it, it does affect you. And it, obviously, if you're a musician, I would imagine it affects your work. Do you think having out of body experiences is something that we should all do as a way to? enhance our own spiritual journey? First of all, everything's a spiritual journey. Everything we do, no matter what you do on this earth, is a spiritual journey, in my opinion, okay, my humble, from what I've experienced. Um, what out of the body experience, and the, one of the reasons I wanted to share this on your podcast, on, on, your, on your channel was because people wonder what comes after death. 
And if I were to take a person that doesn't know how to swim and throw them in the ocean and say, okay, from here on, you, your next life, you, you, your next existence is going to be in the ocean, it would be quite a traumatic experience. Wouldn't it be wonderful if somebody were to throw me in the ocean and I knew how to swim? And so what out-of-the-body experience has taught me personally was that when I started, there was a time when I was a child that I was a lot more adept at it. But as I started to become more of an adult and education started to come in and the fears of life started to come in, I started to realize that my out-of-the-body experiences started to become more limited and I had to learn how to walk all over again. So through my experiences, I learned how to fly. I learned how to go through walls. I learned how to command my reality um, in these out-of-the-body experiences. And what happens is, is you know, if you if you look at the Tibetans, when somebody passes away, they keep telling the, you know, they chant the chant that they sing when somebody passes away. Say, go to the light. Don't stay in the Bardo. The Bardo is the in-between world where a lot of people stay there for months, sometimes years. Sometimes people don't even know they're dead. Sometimes somebody will be driving a car and a pick, you know, in a, in a 16-wheeler will hit them and they won't even know what hit them. And they're dead, but they, they still think they're driving. And you'll find that person on the inner planes in their car driving. They don't know they're dead. And you ask them, well, how long you been here? Oh, I've been here, you know, I don't know. And then you find out that guy died in 1976 and he's still in a car driving, thinking he's driving. Reality works that way because as soul, we're God, we're a particle of God. I mean, for lack of a better word. So when we leave this physical reality, we can, we create anything. So the practice of leaving the body and understanding how those realities work. When you finally make the final transition into those realms and you know how to navigate them, then you can avoid having to come back here and go back into another physical body and forget who you were and have to do it all over again and be at the mercy of the laws of karma. You know, because some people don't necessarily go into another plane of consciousness where they're taught and they're told, oh, you died and here are all your ancestors. Some some beings go directly from one body to another based on their karmic on their karmic. Uh, for lack of a better word, their karmic cycle. And so. They might not even remember who they were in a past lifetime. And so they can keep going and going and going from one lifetime to another. And I personally, I think I've done that enough that I'd like to avoid it. So that's one of the reasons I pursued this very, very seriously. Are you saying that if we resolve our karmic account while we're here, we won't have to come back or just being able to navigate the other realms will be enough that we don't have to come back? Well, it all depends. I mean, karma, you know, when I look at karma and it's, it, it's, it's a double-edged sword because in order for you to experience this lifetime at some point as soul, you were given some level of karma so that you would have the reason to return and return and return. Is it possible to, to, to resolve your karma and not come back? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I and anyone who says anything against that, I disagree with them. Um, is it possible for you to develop your inner bodies so that you may be able to exit while you're in this physical body and experience the other realms to a point where you're adept enough to escape what they call the wheel of 84? Absolutely as well. So it is possible. Um, all right, and it's, it's up to you if you really want to do it. Hold on one second. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but what is the wheel of 84? The wheel of 84 is what they call the wheel where you keep reincarnating over and over and over and over again. That's what they call the wheel of 84. What's the significance of the number? That I don't know. I mean, I know 84 adds up to, in numerology, to 12. 
and it would be the number three. So, um, you know, I've heard it many times in many books referred to the wheel of 84. I never asked what the number meant, um, but it's a, it's a common term. What's also interesting is that you said earlier that it's a privilege to come here. It and is. It is. And I'm not saying it isn't. I'm, I'm not trying to debate you, but I, and, but so many people seem to be at some point in their life like they're so unhappy about being here and they don't want to come back. And I guess they forget it's a privilege of being here in the first place. Well, it's a privilege in the sense, and believe me, I don't think, I'm, I'm not saying that I haven't had those feelings myself at times. Um, but the privilege is that, that, is that if you come here consciously and you realize, which has been a challenge for me at times, I'm not saying these things like I, it's if I, I know all the answers. I don't. But the one thing that I have learned in recent times is that we're an extension of creation of the divine if you want to call it divine creation everything is one and so the one thing that i've learned over and over again in this lifetime which has been had nothing to do with out-of-body experience has been that every time my life has become difficult it has become because because i've actually have bought into the idea of what I'm seeing through my physical eyes and not relied on my inner vision. And so if, if your life is in a situation where you're not happy, you can go outside of yourself and try to change it. Sure, you can. But there's an inner spark within us that can create anything we want. And the, the, the way this reality, this particular reality works, very similar to the other realities, is that as God beings, as creative, as, as, as an extension of the creator, which is what we are, what we think we create. And sometimes those creations take a while to manifest, so we don't recognize them right away, but they manifest. And so the one thing that I've been learning in this lifetime is, okay, I have to continuously discipline my thoughts so that eventually I get on that train where the reality that I'm living is the reality that I'm creating. And the privilege is that when you come here is you get to test that out. It's a great testing ground for that, because when you leave the physical body, your vibration of wherever that vi wherever you've you've acquired uh, do, to whatever spiritual growth you've done here, you're going to go to a realm that's in line with your vibration. And for you to break out of that vibration and go to a higher vibration is going to be a lot harder than being able to test that out here while you're living here. This is basically, it's almost like a, a laboratory, a testing ground where souls can come here and say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to focus on this. Can it happen? In other planes, if you were to do that, you would put the entire plane, your, your thought process would create such a vibration that it would be like a ripple and it would put the entire plane out of balance. Whereas here you can afford to do that. So from that perspective, it is a privilege. Are you saying that it's best then to raise our vibration as high as we can before we leave? Absolutely. Absolutely. What Without are, a doubt. What are the best ways to do that? Well, for example, in I'm going to give you a long answer for this and because and, and, I, I want to cover a few things. I grew up in an Italian Argentinian family. People smoke, people drink, people, you know, uh, many years ago I used to be a casual drinker, was never really into alcohol, but was a casual drinker every so often and have a beer or whatever. 2013, I, I started to hear a voice telling me that it was time to vamp up my practices. I'd been doing it for a long time, but I, I hadn't really made certain breakthroughs that I wanted to make. And so 
hearing this inkling in my head continuously nudging at me, telling me, you fun is over, time to vamp up your. I said, okay. So I got an inkling to go to a bookstore in Santa Monica, uh, near the Third Street Promenade. And so I went there, said, okay, I'm going to go to this bookstore. And I went on the second floor, and there we had all these spiritual books. One of the books mentioned this subject. And I had already been doing it, but I, I was always willing to learn more. So opened up the book, and they mentioned other books. And I went into glossary, and I, 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 they didn't have a book that I was looking for, so I ordered it online. Started reading it. That same author wrote another book, bought that book. And I was able to pick up a few small adjustments to the practices I was doing. And it, you know, and I was off to the races. So I spent most of the year of 2013. I had um, royalties coming in. So financially, I didn't have to worry. And I spent most of 2013, almost 2014 doing out-of-the-body travels during the day and night and really focused in on that. And what I what I realized during that time, I started to go through some traumatic moments, was the fact that I could no longer drink alcohol because it was affecting my practices and I was beginning to have some traumatic experiences. So naturally it forced me to completely eradicate all alcohol from my life, anything, any, any type of, you know, I don't know, anything that that's related to something that's going to alter your perception. And so it, 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 it's, 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 you know, you wonder if it's the chicken or the egg, you know, as you start to do this, you naturally, your life will naturally start to gear towards towards raising your vibration. And when you start on that bandwagon, it's a bandwagon that once you start, it will slowly push you towards a greater state of awareness. You know, it, all it takes is a spark. Like I, I've watched your show and I've seen how some of your, some of your guests had mentioned, oh, I had, a, I had a near death experience and then my life changed. Um, or I, you know, I went to a class and somebody helped me have an out of the body experience. The one thing that people don't may know or may not know is when you leave the body and you do it consciously, there's a moment when you're, when you're exiting the body and you feel a tingling sensation. It's like a drug because your astral body is beginning to become energized from the astral plane. So this tingling sensation that happens is literally like a drug. Your body, you start to feel energized. And when you go into those realms, what happens is, is that your body is, your, your energetic body of that particular reality, because we have multiple energetic bodies until we reach soul. We have an astral body. We have a causal body. We have a mental body. And then we have soul. So the soul, in, other, in, other, in, in order to be able to experience these realities, it needs these interfaces, which are these bodies that we, we, we go into. So when you go into the astral plane, let's say, for example, and you have an experience, what a lot of people don't, under, don't really know, and, or they may, but I think a lot of people don't know, is when you come back and you wake up, you go about your business thinking that everything's fine as Usual, you have some memory of what you had, you write it down. But what a lot of people don't, they take for granted is that you just, your energy body that you've brought back into this physical body has just absorbed energy from a complete different reality. And it's that energy that many times after these people have these experiences, these near-death experiences, that their entire life changed. Well, their entire life changed because they brought all this energy back from these realms into this reality. And naturally, that vibration will change the reality in this reality. All of a sudden, they can't do the things they used to do. All of a sudden, they can't get away with the things they used to be able to get away with. Because what happens is, is when you start doing these activities, there are guides that see among the physical human beings, they say, oh, that one's getting ready to, to pop. Okay. Okay, that one's ready. Okay, we're, we're going to start sending that person because that person's ready to go to the next realm. And it's in their, 
it's in their obligation to to help beings that are getting ready to transition to the next level of evolution to help them in that evolution. I'm going to see if you can put it into just maybe simple, practical things we can do to help our daily lives and raise our vibration. So one would be, you know, stop using alcohol and drugs, obviously, too, if you do that. Yeah. Probably add meditation to your life, or are there any other practical things you can advise us? Well, what, I, what I've learned um, in recent years, a practice that really helps me shut down my mind. Um, and I just, I just want to share this before I, for years, for example, I would, I would, I would, I would watch or I would study, you know, in Buddhism, they teach you how to go into emptiness. And they, you know, all these monks, they talk about emptiness. And I always thought, well, how do you go into emptiness if you don't have a reference point? So the out of the body experience has really taught me a reference point of what it was. And what really helps me a lot is there's a technique called tratak. I don't know if you ever heard of it. It's a simple technique the Hindus um, teach, which is you stare at a candle and you keep your eyes open without closing them. I do that for about an hour a day. It takes time to get your eyes to, and you just stare at the candle and you just don't do anything but just stare at the candle and try to completely empty out your mind. That practice for me was really helpful in the sense of we are bombarded with all kinds of things today through social media, through television, commercials, you know, uh, billboards. And what I love about this technique is that what it does is it's a natural purifier of your mind. And as you do it more and more, you start to see how your mind starts to become more focused. You start having less negative thoughts. Um, it's a simple technique. When you really think about it, the universe is, con- is, is uh, comprised of four elements, water, earth, fire, and air. So when you look at a candle, you're basically looking at one of the most basic elements in the universe. And that connection in itself helps to clear up your third eye. You start to open up. And so as just as a regular practice, even if you do it for 10 minutes a day, I advise everyone to do it. You stare at the candle, you get in a room. You don't necessarily have to be in a dark room. You can be in a day, you know, in a, in a, in a room with some daylight in it, but you stare at the candle, start with 10 minutes, try not to close your eyes. And eventually you start to progress and do it as long, longer, as long as you can. That exercise in itself is, is a gold mine. It's amazing you brought that up because I think there's just something primal about fire that we all love. And unfortunately, where we're at in our civilization, we're never really around it anymore. Unless you're in front of your fireplace and it's cold, but we don't generally cook over a fire. We don't sit outside around fire like we have in our you know, distant past. What I discovered in the process of doing it was that when you think about this world and you think about this universe, you can't help but to wonder what conscious for a lack of a better term, being would create inside a vacuum of darkness thousands, millions, and billions of planets that are all lit by suns. And so you're looking at a candle, you're looking at a, a tear of a sun, you're, you're basically looking at a droplet of the sun. And, you know, it, it, it's helped me out tremendously. And you know, fire, water, you know, earth and air. I mean, a lot of people look at a glass of water and they can tell the future by looking at a glass of water. Another one of the four elements. So these are these are conduits. You know, the on the astral plane, that flame has a reality. And it's light. So in this physical plane, the light manifests through fire. You know, so it's 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 great window to 
to take advantage of. And it's something so, it's under our nose. I mean, all of the knowledge that is available, the real knowledge, it's, it's under our nose. It's, it's right there in front of us, just we don't see it. Do you think it's being hidden from us? I think a lot of people, like I mentioned when I first contacted you, I've read a lot of books and the frustrating thing that I found in a lot of books was that was that they tell you all the attributes, they talk about all the things, but they never really give you the techniques. And so it took me years to find out what the techniques were, where I started to connect the dots. For example, one of the reasons I mentioned not doing living a more pure life in regards to not doing alcohol or, or you know, uh, I mean, I'm not trying to get against the alcohol industry or anything, but it's because in order to be able to travel, in order to be able to acquire or, or access these realities, you need energy. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of the monks end up going into solitude. It's not that they're, cha they're, they're running away from the human experience. They're trying to attain as much energy as possible as they can. In the human experience, there's a lot of energy that we lose, you know, through worry, sometimes, you know, dealing with people, all those things. So in the process of acquiring this energy, you're able to go into these planes. I'll tell you a funny story about that. Um, um, and I'm going back to the stories of Carlos Castaneda. I had read all his books and was a was a, a an avid reader of his books and had studied his books, but I always wondered how some of these characters in his books had all these powers. And at some point there was a woman that came out with a book uh, trying to say that Carlos Castaneda was, you know, he was a hoax and all that. So during my time in LA, I was, um, one time I went to the Pacific Palisades to a barbecue and ran into this woman that I had seen in a few art openings in LA. And uh, she's from uh, Guatemala. And we started talking. It was kind of one of those serendipitous things. And no one knows her. She's never written about this. She's not interested in telling anybody about anything about this. And we started talking about spirituality. And all of a sudden, I mentioned the name Carlos Castaneda. And she told me, I have a story to tell you. She said, I was studying at UCLA. And I was uh, taking a class in American history. And one day, um, the teacher came and said, I have a treat for you guys. Carlos Castaneda is going to teach the class. So he taught the class. And as the class was uh, leaving, as the students were leaving, Carlos Castaneda grabbed her by the, touched her by the arm and said, can I talk to you? And she said, sure. She had no idea who this man was. He sat her down and he said, look, you have an energetic configuration that's very interesting and if you allow me i'd like to teach you a few things so that was the beginning of a period where he would she said she'd sit with her and he would hold her hand and they were off on all kinds of journeys you know at one point she said she was walking through the streets of china with him you know um she traveled inside her body and could see every single cell in our body. And, and so six months went by and her life was absolutely helter skelter because she got to a point where she couldn't tell when she was sleeping or when she was awake, which can happen in this activity. And so one day she went to talk to her friends and said, I don't think I'm gonna be able to continue this with this man because my life is, you know, this is crazy. And she said that, from the moment that she had that conversation with her friends, she disappeared from her life. Now, the reason I'm telling you this story is to, is to explain that in order to achieve these states of awareness, in order to be able to have these experiences, you need energy. And sometimes people use other people's energy, as, you, as I've just given you the example. But there are energetic exercises that you can do to avoid having to take peyote, to avoid having to take the toad, to avoid to having to go to Peru and do ayahuasca. Because as much as I respect these paths and I, I do not criticize them and whoever wants to do them, I, you know, if that's what they want to do, that's fine. These paths are all aligned with the plants. So each plant has a, a ruler. 
And when you have these experiences, you're having these experiences through the eyes of that ruler. For example, the, the ayahuasca or, or peyote. Peyote has, or tabaco. They all have these deities that govern them. And so when you, when you approach these, these paths, they're the ones that take you on a journey. Um, but my path, it's not my path as something as I'm selling or trying to convey, but my path has been a path where I have searched to gather the energy, to do the disciplines, to gather the energy so that when I have those experiences, I can attain those states without taking, without being a slave to anything. Not someone's energy, not a plant, not you know any anything other than an energy that I've acquired on my own. And so when when Carlos Castaneda, when Don Juan talks about a true path, the path with a heart, that's what he meant. Is when you're no longer using the resources other than the resources that you can conjure on by by your own merits, by your own power, to be able to experience these realities. Because it's a karma-less path that way. Can you share with us some of the exercises you were speaking of? Sure. There's an exercise, you know, one of the, I, I picked up a, a, a jewel of knowledge from one of Robert Monroe's books. And I used it. Um, and I'm glad you asked that question because I'm going to explain it in detail. Um, you lie facing north. Hopefully you can do this when you wake up, if you have time, because when you when you're tired and you're going to go to sleep, you're not you're going to fall asleep. So the best time to do is when you have just woken up, you know, you maybe you have a tea or something. Well, not tea because tea might have caffeine, but, you know, you go and you do maybe your bodily functions. You wake up, let's say five, six in the morning. You lie on your bed or you lie on the floor facing north and you take deep breaths and you focus on your stomach because when you focus on your stomach while you're breathing what it does it shuts down your mind and if you have a hard time shutting your mind then you focus at the tip of your nose and you breathe deeply and you hold your breath as long as you can and then you let go and you breathe deeply you hold your breath as long as you can and you hold it as long, as long as you can without, you know, being dangerous and you let go. And then you start to focus on every part of your body and you tell that part of your body to relax. I'm gonna tell my toes to relax. I'm gonna tell, I'm gonna tell my foot to relax. I'm gonna tell my calves to relax. So you get yourself in a very, very deep relaxed state while you're breathing and focusing on your stomach. And you do that for about 10 to 15 minutes. And then you start to imagine a light that's coming out of your body. And that is going through every inch of your physical body. And what that does, it starts to energize and awaken your energy body. And that's an energetic center that you are activating in every bit of your body. And it's about a two and a half hour process. You do that. If you have the discipline to do that for as long as you can, I can guarantee you that you do that exercise. And, you know, and make sure you go through every single part of your body, imagining that light going through every single part of your body. You do that for two and a half hours, and I guarantee you that within a week, you're gonna you're gonna experience something. Um, another exercise which is was very very useful to me was sitting under the sun for ten minutes and letting the rays of the sun hit the top of my head and close my eyes and just imagine the light of the of the sun just going through my entire body. It's a simple exercise, ten minutes a day. I guarantee you, you do those two exercises and you will have an experience. Are you saying we will have an out-of-body experience or some kind of spiritually transformative experience? 
Well, what I'm saying is you will have an experience that will lead you to the next step. The key is consistency. You know, the, the energy exercises, what they do is they start to awaken your energy body. And so as your energy body starts to awaken, because you start to feel it, you'll get to a point where you're actually, when you're focusing, let's say, for example, on your knee and, you're, and, you're, and you have your eyes closed and you're breathing deeply and calmly and you're fully relaxed and you start to focus on your knee, there's going to be a moment you're going to start to feel your knee. And then you go up to your calf. Uh, I mean, to your thigh, and then you go up to your to your hips, and then you go up through your stomach, and you know through your groin, through your. There's going to be a moment where you you know not the first time maybe, but the second time, third time, fourth time, you're going to start to feel something. You're going to actually start to feel where you're focusing on, and that's the beginning of where your energy body starts to awaken. And you're, energi you're energizing it. So all of a sudden, as your energy body starts to become aware and, and, and you start to become in tune with it, because now you're feeling your energy body. How can I use a vehicle if I can't even feel it? So as you as you're start to feel your energy body and you start to get the tingling sensations, what happens is, is... For example, what happened to me, this is, this is the one question I used to ask myself. Why is it that in the, the Radha Swamis or all these monks, they all talk about, oh, you wake up at 3.30 in the morning and you start to meditate. I always used to wonder, I used to say, well, how do these people get through the day if they wake up at 3.30 in the morning? How are you going to get through? If I'm a working person, I got to go to work at 8 o'clock in the morning. How am I going to wake up at 3.30, 4 in the morning and do meditation? So I got to go to sleep, what, at, at, at 6 o'clock in the afternoon? It's impossible. I have to have dinner. I have to eat. And the one thing that I learned, and th these are the, the, the jewels that I, that, I, that, I, that I learned through a lot of years of, of, was that these monks, some of them, they're not telling you that they wake up at 3.30 in the morning and then they stay awake. What happens is you start doing these exercises and then eventually you'll see that naturally your inner body will wake you up at 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning. There's a lot of people that tell me this all the time, and they don't know why. They say, I don't know why, but I wake up at 4 in the morning. I don't know why. It's their energy body waking them up. So you start doing these exercises at 4 in the morning, exactly what I just told you. Obviously, you can't do the sun, but you do the, you know, you wake up, you get yourself awake, you slap yourself in the face a couple of times to get yourself awake, and then you lie down. And you start doing these energy exercises. And what happened to me was, after a while of doing these, I started to fall asleep. But I wasn't falling asleep. I was going into a complete blackout. It was all darkness. And then I would wake up. And I knew that I was awake, but my body was asleep. And I would turn. And I would exit. And many times, I found myself that I was afraid to open my eyes because I would think I'm going to open my eyes and I'm going to wake up because I was physically having this experience. I was saying, I'm going to wake up. I'm going to open my eyes. I'm going to be in my room. And all of a sudden I would open my eyes and I was in a city far away from where I was. And I was able to walk through these streets and interact with some of these citizens of these realms. There are some of these realms these people don't even know we exist. They have no idea there's an earth plane because they've never had to come down here. Do you think that that realm you were in when you went into this blackout realm is the same thing that near-death experiencers go to when they go to the black void? It's very possible. They, they you know, until the... They go into the black void. It's possible that their, their physical body is going through a process of shutdown. And so all of a sudden their soul awakens because it is the physical body that has been keeping that energy body asleep. For example, I knew a teacher of mine who used to do this. And he said sometimes he would wake up and come out of his body and he would see all these people sleeping. And their astral body was sleeping right on top of them, floating right on top of them, completely unaware. And when they would wake up was because the reason we sleep is because 
it'll boil, everything boils down to energy. These human bodies need energy. So what happens? We get tired. Our astral body leaves our physical body right above us, and it sleeps, and it's gathering energy. It's gathering energy from the astral plane. And then once it gets enough energy, it, it wakes up. It, it wakes us up because we've gathered enough energy. You know, so it's, it's like a battery. And that's what I tell people about meditation. For example, when you do the energy exercises or you do Tratak, when you do meditation, what you're basically doing is you're charging your energy body. You're charging it here. So there's a connection when you go to sleep that it becomes aware so that you can use that energy body to venture into other realities and have those experiences. And when you have those experiences, and you start to learn what's beyond this realm. The moment of transition, you'll be prepared. You'll know how to use your energy body. I have found myself at times with, with uh, guides that have taught me how to fly. You know, no, do this, do that. Because there was a time where I was like a, like a toddler. And I was like, I can't move. You know, how many people tell you I had this dream, but I couldn't move. I was aware, but people were chasing me and I couldn't move. Well, it's because they're out of their body and they don't know how to use it. So as you experience and how to use this body in the other realms, you have a lot more chances that when you finally make the transition, you'll be prepared and you'll be acquainted with that realm so you can make the right choices. You're not terrified by the light. You're not terrified by the things you see. You're, you're, you're completely... You know, and that's 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 the thing that for me is is crucial in 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 the search and in the in in doing all of this because what would be the point of us living in this reality and going into a death without knowing anything and living a life based on the fact that we think that after death nothing comes? Imagine the choices you can make when you live a life knowing that you can go to sleep. And you can go into a realm and see your relatives who have just passed on and talk to them and go see cities that are filled with light and bring that light back into this world and have that perspective where when you go to sleep, you're living in another reality. And when you wake up, you're living this reality. Imagine the choices you can make having that experience as opposed to living a life where the only thing that you believe is all that there is is here. I think the choices you make are very different. So from, 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 from even a quality of life value, I think it's imperative that people learn this. Are you saying that our consciousness leaves our physical body and then attaches to our astral body and uses that astral body as a vehicle to astral travel? Mm -hmm. You're, we're, we are basically light. Consciousness is light. In the higher realms, everything is light. It's just light, consciousness. There's no physicality. That thing which you call light, that is aware, that is an extension of the divine creation. I, I don't want to use the word divine because some people might. The divine aware, or the, 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 the total consciousness separates itself. And through that light, in order to be able to come into these regions, it takes on a body. And that awareness, which is what some people call soul, will take a body in the causal plane. And in the causal plane, we'll experience whatever it needs to experience. Some souls decide, you know what, I want to go down to the mental plane. Or the, you know, I'm... Uh, you know, I want to go down to the, uh, I think it's the astral, causal, mental, and then etheric. So some souls decide, you know, I want to experience the astral plane. Well, they need an astral body. Just like you need a human body. But the, the atom of it all is soul. Is soul is the awareness that goes into these bodies and uses these bodies just like we're physically using this physical body. You know, and so the physical body, you have the physical body, you have the astral body, you have the causal body, you have the mental body. Then you go into the world, into the etheric body. And then eventually you go into the soul planes. And in the soul planes, they're just realms of light. It's just light. 
and um, and so yes, in in uh, to put it to put it in those terms, yeah, I guess you're right. I think many of us want to be able to have an out of body experience, but have not figured out how to do it. So, do you think the best way to do it is start doing that exercise that you recommended? laying in your bed or laying on the floor with your head facing north and start, you know, feeling parts of your body and raising your energy. And then eventually, once you get to that level of energy needed, it'll just start happening spontaneously. Absolutely. It's that simple. It's really that simple. What is the significance of laying with your head facing north? It was something that I picked up in a Robert Monroe book. I don't, I think it, maybe it's, it has something to do with the um, electromagnetic currents of the earth. Maybe, um, you know, you lay North, I, you know, I mean, uh, it worked for me. It's been really key. And I've come to realize that if I lay East or I lay West, I have a different experience. If I lay South, I'll have a different experience. Laying North has been a really a great tool for me personally. I invite people to try it. I'm not saying they're not going to have an experience if they do the exercises, you know, maybe facing east. Um, but for me, it was it was really, really helpful. And uh, because the moment that I lie down facing north, once you've been doing this a long time, it's very hard. It's very easy to you just you just naturally fall into the state and you start to feel the tingling because you've been doing it a long time. So your, your energy body is already attuned saying, okay, okay. It's, it's, it's this what you want to do now. Okay. Let's do this. You know? And what happens is, is that the more you do it, it becomes addicting to the point where, you know, I had to kind of, be careful because it would have been very easy for me to completely lose total interest on this earth when you start to experience these things. So you have to do it with a sense of balance because you are here and we are responsible for the bodies we have here. We've made a choice to come to this earth. We've made a choice to experience this. And so, um, but it is, it's, it is easy to, once you start to experience the out of body experience and you start to, have that tingling sensation. You start to absorb the energies that are available to you in those realms to want to say, you know what, I just, I could very easily have a night, you know, just have a job that I work part-time three hours a day and this is all I want to do. It, it's very easy to fall into that, which is what led me to understand why these masters in India that they talk about, because a lot of people talk about renunciation. You always wonder, what is this renunciation? How am I going to renunciate? I enjoy having dinner. I enjoy having friends. And I think that's a wonderful thing to do. You, you're here to experience that. And I never understood this whole idea of renunciation until I started to experience this. And when I started to experience this, I realized now I understand why these people wanted to renunciate. It's not that they were... You know, and then the Catholic religion all of a sudden forced these priests to renunciate without that spiritual awareness. How can you renunciate something if you still desire it? But the moment you start to experience these realities, that's when it, it, an internal thing changes in you where you say, I'm no longer naturally interested in doing this or naturally interested in doing that. I'd rather do this and experience and go for an experience in this realm. And as you experience that more and more, eventually, you naturally renunciate things. They come naturally. And that's, I think that's, that's the thing that they don't teach us. Those are the things that all these religions don't teach you, you know? And so uh, you have to experience them. Since you mentioned Bob Monroe, have you done the Gateway program? And if so, what is your opinion on using binaural beats, especially as a musician? For me, binaural beats, I have, you know, the uh, what they call a hemisync, right? Correct. Right. Hemis um, I tried them. Um, the one thing that I've been doing lately is I, I love some of the mantras I have found on YouTube because what it allows me to do is when I do Tritak, I'm able to sh just go into a zone and completely shut down my mind. From, a pr from that perspective, they're fantastic. 
In other words, if I want to shut down my mind for an hour and I want to meditate on, on a point in the wall or close my eyes and completely shut down my mind, I think they're fantastic. But what happens to me as a musician, I'm not saying this is for everybody, but what happens to me as a musician, when I, when I, if I'm listening to certain things, my attention goes there. And so what I learned was if I want to, if I want to use meditation to charge myself, yeah, they, they're very useful. But if I want to have an out-of-the-body of experience, it's helpful if I just hear my breath and I go into complete silence because eventually I'm going to pass out and going to go into that blackness so that my, 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 my inner body wakes up and can, and can exit. And so for that, I can't have anything in my ears listening to something. It's going to, it's going to take my attention. Do you think that you have manifested your success in the in your music career? Define success. Well, I mean, you... have I have I been able to do what I love? I that has been something that I I have done because I have forcibly pursued it. It hasn't been easy, you know. It's it, I've had a lot of challenging times. I think what what it has what i love about what i've been able to do is is that my craft has allowed me to spend a lot of time alone and manage my own time so that i could do these activities if i had a 9 to 5 that i had to go to an office i don't think i would have been able to do some of the things i've been able to do and so um and when i'm in the realm of music i'm in a i'm in a different vibration of existence so sometimes as i'm writing a piece of music i start to see things as well um, and so that's what I love. It's that my work, the activity of my work allows me to fuel the activity of my personal interests in this field. Um, and so, you know, but there's also a part that is business that you have to address. And so you have to, when you do these things, you have to be very aware that we are on this earth to experience this realm. There's been times where I've stopped forcibly to have out-of-body experiences because what I realized after traveling and traveling, traveling, there's going to be a point which is another. That that's the other step that you that you come across with is you do these experiences and you start to travel and you start to go to these realms and you start to meet these beings and you start to see these cities, the cities they talk about in the Bible. You know these these great churches and people are there. Some people don't even know. That, um, that 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 there that some people still believe that Jesus is coming back and they're in these churches after this realm and they're praying and, and you see things like that or you go to other realms where there's the Buddhists or you go to other realms where there's the Muslims and what you realize after traveling and you travel there's times where you actually get tired of traveling. You go through these realms and you go after realms and you're completely aware and you're flying through them. And you go, okay, now what? Where do I go now? And so one thing I've taken from having all these experiences was that when they tell you that everything is now, what these experiences taught me is that everything is now. That you can travel to these regions and it's important to have that experience. But the most important thing when you, that you take away from all of it is that everything is now and that you are at the center of your own universe and to focus on that. And so for me to have, it took me that journey to experience all these out-of-the-body experiences and to see these universes and to understand a separation and to get a perspective to finally reach the point where now I'm actually focusing more on creating an eternal now because as I get closer to the now I become more in tuned with my real with who I really am which is an extension of the divine creation it appears right now that there are more humans on the planet than ever why do you think that is that's a good question. I mean, I know, for example, there are lines and lines and lines of souls trying to get here. Yeah. And um, 
I suppose is because time is changing. Things are becoming faster. So haven't you noticed how time is flying faster in this reality? Well, I, so just, I was going to say that maybe just because I'm getting old. <laughs> no, but things are happening faster if you see it. So in this, on this earth plane, in this particular planet, things are becoming, they're, they're speeding up. And so with that speed up, you can burn karma quicker in this earth plane than you would. And so these souls are saying, if I can spend, let's say, even 10 years or 15 years, I might be able to speed up my process, which is why they're lining up. Do you think there's some kind of event that may be happening soon on the planet? I mean, do I really? I mean, don't, you don't think there's enough events happening already on this planet that would speed up the process for a lot of these souls? Well, maybe something, something Big? even bigger. I don't know. I, I have a lot of faith that um, that something tells me we're going to survive. We're going to continue. It's just that the state of awareness and the state of time is going to speed up. And so it's going to allow certain souls to come here and experience things and be able to resolve things quicker than in other times in our history. You mentioned Jesus earlier, and I want to know what is your opinion on Christ consciousness? My opinion on Christ consciousness is, is Jesus uh, was uh, an enlightened being that did the disciplines that he needed to do to achieve a certain state that took him to a certain plane, one of the planes that I mentioned. And so when you do these exercises and you eventually, as you develop your artistry through these exercises because it's like an art you start to get better at them just like playing an instrument you get better and better and better and you reach different heights i think jesus reached a certain height and what happens and this is what i want to address through the, the christ consciousness when you leave the body you can choose to focus on certain areas and if you live a clean life in regards to you don't smoke, you don't drink, and you try, and, and the reason I say those things, it's not because there's anything wrong with smoking, anything wrong with drinking, but those things take away energy from you. So if you live a life where you can, when you can do a life that will help you at, attain as much energy possible to be able to reach these planes. Eventually, if you if you dedicate that, that's why a lot of these monks meditate for hours and hours and hours. They're trying to acquire energy to be able to achieve these states of being. And Jesus was one of those beings that achieved enough energy that when you achieve enough energy, you can become a resident of some of these planes of consciousness, not just travel to them, but become a resident. And what that, what that ensures you is that when you become a resident of those planes, the moment you, you, you transcend, you transition, you, you transcend the astral plane, you transcend the, the mental plane, and you go straight to a much higher plane within this lifetime. That is possible. And so when you become a resident of these planes, like I mentioned, your energy body brings back that energy from those planes to this earth. And with that, energy comes the power to be able to change things on this earth that go against what human beings consider natural laws. So, and those things happen naturally. I don't think Jesus decided to reach these states because he wanted to turn water into wine. It was, it was a byproduct of the fact that he had reached these states of consciousness. And so, he had reached a state of consciousness through being becoming a resident of, of, of these higher levels of awareness that the moment that he would come back from those experiences and be here, his thoughts became reality. He would think this person's healed and they would become healed. That's how powerful it is. Well, since what you do is create music for movies, I don't think you have anything else that you want to let people know about. So before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Every dream anyone's ever had is possible. And 
every question that everyone has, they can find the answer for themselves with what I've spoken about today. Ourself. And don't be possible. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid because there's a great white light waiting for everyone on the other side. Marcelo, thank you for that message. And thank you again for being my guest. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.